And oceans are dynamic. Water is constantly in motion. Um, the uh, oceanic and atmospheric circular patterns move heat around and strongly influence climate. Coastion, um, coastlines are dynamic too. They advance and retreat depending on the balance of erosion and, and deposition. Here's a storm at Nags Head, North Carolina, and um, some of those houses are in trouble. Well, how do oceans and coastlines change? Well, the coastlines advance, they retreat. Um, here you have a mansion on the edge of, in Malibu, California, uh, beach homes, and um, it's a fight to keep the um, edge of that cliff from eroding underneath those homes, especially the one on the left looks uh, like it's in trouble. Um, in the short term, the position of the coastline can change depending on daily tides and seasonal variations. In the long term, it changes um, as you get um, erosion and deposition. Uh, climate cycles are measured over decades, centuries, and millennia, and the rise and fall of sea levels will affect coastlines. Also, tectonic cycles occurring over thousands and millions of years revitalizes coast, coastline through uplift, and as, as continents are uplifted or or shrink down, it will affect um, what we see as the shape of continents or the edge of the edge of the continents what, that we call a coast. And humans can influence coasts and oceans and coastline as well. Um, more than a quarter of the U.S. population lives along the Atlantic and Gulf coasts, so uh, management of our coastlines is uh, critical for uh, much of the U.S. population. As an example of coastlines changing, let's look at the shelf off of the coast of New Jersey. Notice that there's a submarine canyon right down that shelf. Well, during the last uh, glaciation period um, in the northern hemisphere, when the sea level dropped, uh, the continental shelf off that coast of New Jersey was exposed because um, lower sea level and um, now, and what had happened, the Hudson River cut a deep, narrow canyon right through that continental shelf um, because it was cutting its way down to a lower sea level. Then the, the glaciers melted, the sea level rose, and we have the coastline the way it is today. Well, here's some questions to think about. How have you interacted with the world's oceans, either directly or indirectly? Um, we like to go on vacation down in the Florida Panhandle every summer if we can and enjoy um, the nature that um, God rules and enjoy the power of the ocean. It's just amazing how much power there is in the wind and the waves in the ocean. Another question, would you prefer to live along the coast or further inland away from the ocean? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of living along the coast? I remember visiting uh, the uh, Bible Society in Accra, Ghana um, a few years ago and one of the problems they have in Accra, Ghana is there's so much humidity and salt water in the air that their laptop computers um, corrode quickly and so that's one disadvantage they have in uh, West Africa along the coast um, and there's three elemental sounds of nature according to Henry Boston one the sound of the ocean on a shore two rain three wind in the woods maybe you got some other suggestions of elemental sounds of nature um, I I could think of pine, a wind rustling through pine trees and just hearing that sound as a background. Well, from what we've learned about plate tectonics, would we expect the depths to be the same throughout the world's ocean or not? Well, the depth of the ocean varies from zero meters along the coast to a maximum of 11 kilometers or seven miles deep along the Mariana Trench. Compared to Mount Everest, um, it would be down in that trench with another uh, 2,000 meters above it of water. So the, the um, variation of depth in the ocean is much long, much higher or much deeper than the variation of um, mountain chains on the surface of the earth. The average at land elevation is less than a kilometer, but the average ocean depth is 3.8 kilometers or 2.3 miles. And the volume of water in the ocean is nearly 10 times the volume of dry land that lies above sea level. And if erosion leveled all the oceans, all the eroded material would fit in the ocean's basins and there'd be no land on the earth. Praise God, he's put mechanisms in place so that we have land on earth. 
Um, Psalm 104 says that. And I, um, he put a mechanism in place where you have lighter felsic material, rock, floating on denser mafic or oceanic basaltic rock. Well, the elevation of the ocean surface varies because the elevation of the ocean floor varies. So the word bathymetry is the word we need to talk about here. It's the word you need to know. And it's the measurement of the depth of the ocean floor and the mapping of its features. And we can use data from ships and submarines, submarines and combine that with satellite data to reveal the topography of the ocean floor. And the ocean floor has the longest mountain chains in the world. Um, it has mountains, valleys, plains, all similar to what we see on land, but under the ocean. And the masses of rock in the ocean floor exert a gravitational pull on the water, uh, just like um, uh, mountains on the earth. And um, because of that gravity, um, water tends to pile up and form mounds on the ocean surface above those uh, mountains under the water. So you can actually look at the um, changes in elevation from a satellite of uh, water piling up or, or um, not piling up on the surface of the ocean from satellite and do a bathymetric map of what's under the ocean water. Pretty cool. Well, if we assume sea level is zero meters, um, then we um, go from there to know what elevation is above sea level or um, below sea level. And sea level changes are due to changes in the shape of the ocean basins or long time climate changes that trap water in the ice caps. Um, you see a picture of what we were just talking about in the last slide where you have water piling up above a, a mountain under the ocean. And those um, bumps and low points that you get um, on the surface of the water, you can use a satellite and map um, uh, whether or not there's a topographic feature under that. And you can use that and confirm that with what we study from ships or submarines and put that in um, a massive computer and um, start to map and even very finely map what's under the ocean floor. There's four major depth zones on the floor of the ocean. One we call the continental shelf. Two, the abysmal Abys abyssal plain. I keep wanting to say abysmal, but it's ab abyssal plain. Three, the oceanic ridge. And four, oceanic trenches. I kind of like abysmal plain better because it's, um, <laughs> it's not a very nice part of the ocean just because it's not a lot going on there. Anyway, abyssal plain. Um, and there's some pictures of each of those. We've seen those same pictures when we looked at plate tectonics. So let's talk about the continental shelf to start with. Uh, continental shelf, there's a picture of it there. Um, and it's the shallow ocean floor adjacent to the continent, either a passive or an active continent. I'm happy to show the active continent there. And it's, um, it's where submerged continental crust slopes away from the coast. Its maximum depth is only a few hundred meters. And it's, it's real shallow and it's really thin in this picture because that's a uh, that's an active continental margin, but it's really wide on a passive continental margin. And it decreases away from the coastline in, toward the ocean. And um, the continental slope is the edge of the continental shelf that, that goes right on down into the abyssal plain or the oceanic trench, depending on whether it's an active or passive. So, abyssal plain. Well, that's where you have um, the deep ocean floor that is um, basically in between everything else. It's covered with layers of fine sediment. It may be dotted with sea mounts or underwater volcanoes. And um, it's, it's where the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> it's where the um, flattest portion, portion of the Earth's surface is. There's just not a lot of features there except for the um, sea mounts. Now that's not necessarily true, that's just what we know today. That may change as we get more data. And the oceanic ridge is really an interesting place because there we have um, uh, material that coming out of the interior of the earth and we have types of life there that couldn't live 
um, in places that would be death to any other kind of life. For example, tube worms or crabs amazingly can live deep, deep, deep under the ocean. Um, well, this oceanic ridge system is a submarine mountain chain, and you can trace that mountain chain around the whole world. Um, it doesn't heat the water much because the water, uh, the heat dissipates really quickly in the ocean. And 90% of the Earth's volcanic activity happens to be at these ocean ridges. And uh, it's where you get the Earth's crust spreading apart at that point. And I like the scripture that says um, there's springs in the deep. Um, God put those oceanic springs there to um, uh, bring material out of the earth into the oceans. And he even talks about that in Psalm 104. Well, zone four is the oceanic trench. And um, <clears throat> this is where two plates converge together. And when they push together, um, and one plate is subducted down into another plate, oceanic plate is subducted underneath the continental plate, the, um, or an oceanic plate is subducted into another, below another oceanic plate, um, the um, Earth's, um, the, uh, the crust of the Earth is pull, pulled down, and these are the deepest places on the Earth. So you can get up seven miles deep in some of these trenches. So let's look at a cross section and um, note there's an XY line there between Australia and um, South America. So which of the profiles kind of matches that? Well, we know that we have an oceanic trench over in uh, South America side. And so it would be more like that because you have a trench, a deep trench on the right side. So here's another map. Don't worry about the XY line. We, I'm just happening to use the same map as the other one. Identify three active or continental margins and three passive. And so let's go ahead and do that. Well, there's a active um, continental margin to where the Nazca plate is subducting down below the South American plate. Here is an active continental margin where um, you have uh, a plate pulling apart. And here's an active continental margin where you have um, a, the Pacific plate um, converging with the um, Eurasian plate underneath Japan. Here's a passive margin because there's no tectonic activity there. It's just riding along on the back of the North American plate. Here's a passive margin because um, there's no activity there as the um, Antarctic plate and African plate are pulling apart, to separating there, and uh, there's nothing, uh, no, ha no activity going on there. And the same with the east coast of South America, that's a passive margin. Well, where did our oceans come from? Well, the early Earth was a hostile mass um, of molten rock, and Volcanic eruptions put gases, including water vapor, into the air in the very, very, very early Earth. Well, and as the Earth cooled, this water vapor condensed into liquid water. And um, so you had <laughs> thousands of years of rain when it first started to, the Earth started to cool. And that water vapor condensed into liquid water. Um, and that water collected into the hollows in the Earth. And those hollows of the earth grew into what we now call now call our present oceans, which um, uh, took the form that we have now similar, similar to what we have now soon after the earth was first created or about 4 billion years ago. Um, the present ocean configuration is a result of plate tectonics, uh, but no ocean basin we have now um, at, existed uh, over 200 million years ago because remember the Earth's surface keeps changing. And even now, seas and oceans grow and shrink and um, it continues. And the oceans are salty because the seawater has dissolved salts and minerals. Um, 
lots of ways to get into that, including those um, mid-oceanic ridges and the material coming out of the earth um, helps dissolve um, salts and minerals in the seawater. Um, most of what is in the seawater is sodium chloride uh, salt, um, about 85-86%. Then you get sulfate, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and then some trace, trace elements. Um, including um, manganese, lead, gold, iron, iodine, um, lots of minerals in sea. Well, let's talk about uh, depth of the ocean and how we can use things like elephant seals as researchers. We can, um, scientists have glued sensors on the back of um, that elephant seal and you can see it on the back of her head. It doesn't hurt her any. And then um, because elephant seals migrate from California to Alaska and back and they dive 600 meters down into the ocean um, to get food, they're really good um, tools for scientists to use to study ocean. And here is temperature versus depth diagram of um, information from elephant seals. Um, so it's really interesting to look at that, that kind of data and get detailed data um, of temperature versus depth all along the um, west coast of the United States and Canada. Oceanic salinity. Well, salinity is influenced by uh, temperature, by the mixing of currents, by how much fresh water is input from rain, streams, and melting ice. Uh, salinity is highest where the temperature is high and you get loss of evaporation and where precipitation is low so you don't get much rain and so if you look at the picture notice that the red are higher salinities and the blue are lower salinities and basically salinity uh, um, is just how salty the ocean is so the ocean is saltier where it's red and less salty where it's blue um, so it's it, it does vary around the ocean. We may have noticed that the ocean was not the highest in salinity around the equator. Well, that's because there's more precipitation around the equator, so it dilutes the waters. So even though there's more evaporation, there's more precipitation to make up for that. And um, another question is, why might the salinity be at near the Hawaiian Islands be only 0.2% different from the salinity off the coast of Antarctica? Well, ocean currents um, mix up the salinity of the oceans. So it either dilutes salinity or brings um, more saline water to an area and, and mixes it up. Um, so here's a map of the mean salinity for the Indian Ocean. And notice there's Africa on the left and then Australia on the right and Asia above. Explain why salinity values are lower for the tropical Bay of Bengal east of India, then the cold waters of southern ocean near the um, north of Antarctica. And why do you think the salinity is so high in the Red Sea, where it's red there, between Africa and Saudi Arabia? Well, that's because the salinity in, in the Bay of Bengal is diluted by runoff from the Ganges and the Brahmaputra rivers. Um, so it dilutes the salinity there east of India and the um, the Red Sea has so is so such a high salinity is because there's not a, a um, ocean currents that are um, making any uh, diluting it um, you get lots of evaporation and you don't have rivers flowing into it remember the Nile River flows into the Mediterranean not into the Red Sea and salinity also varies with depth Here's a um, uh, <clears throat> map of the Pacific Ocean, and the island in the middle there is Hawaii sticking up. And um, so it's, it's kind of scrunched in because you take the whole of the Pacific Ocean and it, um, it looks really vertical. But notice that the salinity is the highest at the uh, surface where you get evaporation, and the deeper waters really don't have a change in salinity. They're pretty stable. Um, 
whereas the salinity varies quite a bit at the surface where you get evaporation and flow of input from streams. And notice that there's a level at a certain depth, we'll just say it looks like it's about 2,000 meters deep, where the salinity just kind of levels off and doesn't change. Well, not only salinity changes in the ocean, but also temperatures change in the ocean. And temperatures vary according to latitude. Um, notice that the highest temperatures in the ocean are around the equatorial area and on uh, north and south of there, up to um, looks like about 20, 23 degrees um, north and south latitude, um, or maybe even up to 30 degrees. Uh, so uh, ocean temperatures are affected by how much sun there is and also ocean currents and where water is being move it, moved. Now, water with this has a specific heat and um, the specific heat is defined as the amount of thermal energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of material by one degree centigrade. And uh, so water has a high specific heat. In other words, it takes quite a bit of energy to raise a gram of water one degree centigrade. Water can absorb a lot of thermal energy, in other words it can absorb a lot of sunlight without displaying much change in temperature. Um, so if you if you live close to water that means it's going to have a tempering effect and we'll study this when we get into climates. It's going to have a tempering effect on how much temperature changes happen to be happen around um, Around, around that body of water. In other words, it's not going to get as hot, it's not going to get as cold if you live next to a body of water. Well, the specific heat of water in the oceans is about four times that of rock and soil and continents. In addition, water in the continent on the oceans moves while rock and soil doesn't move that much. So what are the implications of these observations for differences in the maximum and minimum water temperatures of the oceans and continents? Well, Materials with lower specific heat will raise the temperature far more for each unit of heat that is absorbed. Consequently, hot temperatures will be more extreme on the continents because the temperature of neighboring oceans will change more slowly. Likewise, while cooling occurs, rocks and soils have less heat to lose and will cool more rapidly to, higher, to lower temperatures in water. Further, there will be little mixing of high and low temperature material land while mixing will occur in the oceans mixing will reduce the extremes in temperature. Let's look at that same um, uh, cross-section of the ocean water going across the Pacific Ocean, only this time let's look at temperature instead of salinity. And you notice that there's a rapid change of temperature or um, with depth, we call that a thermocline, uh, at the surface of the ocean so there's a rapid change down to, oh, it looks maybe like 500 meters, and then a slow change down to about 2,000 meters, and then no, hardly any change below that. Well, cold water is denser than warm water, but below 4 degrees centigrade, when, before um, water freezes, that changes. And the density of really cold water, just before it freezes, decreases. Um, so water is really interesting its properties and the, the fact that um, this density difference in water between cold and warm water affects the oceans also. So you have shallow layers of ocean water that are relatively warm, warmed by solar, radi solar radiation, and you have relative, uh, relative um, uniform temperatures as water is mixed with the currents. So again the thermocline it's the depth zone in the ocean where temperature decreases mo most rapidly, where it gets colder. So you go down into the ocean. Um, a third factor that f affects the density of water in the ocean is pressure. Well, uniform increase in pressure with depth slightly increases density of the underlying water. So you have salinity, you have temperature, and you have pressure to combine um, this um, a density profile um, that you're looking at there. So it's a, called a pycnocline and um, so those three things, salinity, temperature, and pressure combine to make this one, one graph as you go down into the ocean. 
Um, so you have a rapid increase of density. Um, actually, at the surface, you don't hardly have any change in density. And then from 200 down to 1,000 meters in depth, you have a rapid deep increase in density. Ocean water gets much denser. Then um, below a certain point, about 1,000 meters, uh, the density levels off and doesn't change that much. Um, it's important to also know that ocean water is in constant motion and if you're um, saving fuel on a ship or if you're using um, sails on a ship and following the currents that's important to know and the circular patterns of ocean currents we call gyres and you can see the um, path of those currents around the ocean and if you know your history the uh, gyre in the North Atlantic um, had a big impact on the, um, the way sailing ships traveled between Europe and Africa and um, the New World of the Caribbean and then North America. Here's a little cartoon showing gyres and let's go ahead and start this from the, from the beginning and play it. And we see in the North Pacific we have a clockwise gyre. In the South Pacific, we have an anti or counterclockwise gyre. Same in the North Atlantic and South Atlantic. And then um, an anti or counterclockwise gyre in the, South in, in the Indian Ocean. And then there's an equatorial countercurrent that um, we get in between uh, those other currents. So then there's also an circumpolar current that um, you get going around um, the uh, continent of Antarctica. Well, winds move ocean water and the friction between wind and surface water um, affects that movement. And ocean currents follow prevailing wind direction except where the um, current encounters a barrier, say the land mass. Land mass. Um, only about 10% of the world's ocean water is moving on surface current. The rest is under deep underwater. Um, here's a, a Gulf Stream coming from the Gulf of um, Mexico on up into the Atlantic toward Europe. And that's one reason Europe is as warm as it is, because you have the warm Gulf Stream, very critical to um, the current way um, uh, uh, Europeans have warmer weather than they would and here we have a circulation pattern in the atmosphere that generates gyres. Um, it's clockwise in the northern hemisphere. Um, water may take months or years to complete a gyre circuit. And um, we have fast, fast flowing boundary currents at western extents of gyres that redistributes warm tropical water toward the poles. Example of that is the Gulf Stream. And the eastern portion of the gyres carry colder water from the high latitude toward the equator. Uh, that's why, and you don't see it in the picture here, that's why it, you have to wear a wetsuit when you go um, uh, when, when you go to California and go surfing because you have that cold water coming from the northern Pacific down across California. So here's a uh, question, you got a shipment of rubber elephants that falls overboard in the northern Pacific at location A, and what path do those elephants follow? Well, they go from A to E to C to G and back to A. So they go in that gyre. And you have a Coriolis effect in the ocean, and that's where atmospheric and oceanic circulation patterns are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. The earth rotates from west to east and objects in the equator are moving faster than those near the poles just because um, of that circulation and that affects ocean oceanic circulation as well. So how would the deflection of ocean currents be altered in the northern hemisphere if earth rotated the other direction east to west instead of from west to east? Well, currents would switch, switch directions, and the deflection um, would be the other direction. Uh, continents affect ocean circulation patterns as well. 
And here we have the, um, a continent in the middle Miocene as compared to the middle Eocene. Notice the difference of where North and South America are. Um, uh, when the Isthmus of Panama closed, it drastically affected the patterns along the Atlantic. And so that's what we're trying to show in these pictures. Notice that in the middle Miocene 14 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama is closed, whereas in the middle Eocene 50 million years ago, the Isthmus of Panama was not closed. And what that did is the western currents were forced north when that closed. So you have a western current in the northern Atlantic, and it went right through that um, Isthmus of Panama until it was closed off. And that strengthened the Gulf Stream. And because of that, you had warmer waters going in the North Atlantic. It raised the temperatures in Europe. And suddenly you had milder winters in Europe and the northern um, U.S., Canada area just because that Isthmus of Panama was closed. Just think of the, what would, how different um, weather in Europe would be if that did not, was not closed off. Well, Antarctica is another interesting um, story when you talk about the effect of continents. 34 million years ago, um, ice growth was triggered in Antarctica. Well, why was that? Well, when South America and Australia separated from Antarctica, um, there were warm tropical waters that moved south and warmed Antarctica. And when those separated through, through um, plate tectonics, they moved apart. They opened up strong currents in the Southern Ocean and isolated Antarctica from the moderating ocean currents. And so you had a strong circumpolar current going around Antarctica now that didn't used to be there because it, it couldn't go around. It would mix with the warmer water coming from the tropics and it helped keep Antarctica warmer. Antarctica is really cold now, but before 34 million years ago, it was not so cold, even though it was at, toward the South Pole or at the South Pole. A little bit more about the Gulf Stream, um, since it really is so very important for um, North America and for Europe. It carries high salinity warm waters from the central Atlantic to higher latitudes. And um, as the water um, goes north, it slowly cools, and that salty, cold water then sinks to the bottom of the North Atlantic when it gets to about Greenland and Iceland. And that sinking water is then carried southward along the bottom of the Atlantic until it reaches Antarctica, and then it's diverted eastward to the Indian and Pacific Oceans, and then that deep current eventually comes up in the North, in, North and India and, and Pacific Ocean as an upwelling. And that brings nutrients to the surface waters. So that's really interesting that you've got high salinity water that if you start in the Gulf, in the Gulf of Mexico area, it goes on up um, uh, through the Atlantic and eventually in the Pacific Ocean. Well, that's where whaling ships used to go because whales would go to that north to that Pacific Ocean area and eat the plankton that came that fed on those nutrients. So the fact that we have whaling in the Pacific is partly because of this thermohaline circulation. Um, so the word that you want to know is thermohaline circulation. In other words, it's deep deep ocean currents um, that circulate driven by both salinity and temperature. Let's see a nice map of what we just talked about. And so you see um, warm currents and cold currents. You see a warm current starting at the Gulf of New Mexico, Gulf Stream, going up to Europe. It cools around Iceland and Greenland. And then as it cools, that, that um, goes south under, underwater at the bottom of the ocean until it hits Antarctica then flows toward the east at Antarctica, comes up into the Indian Ocean, and warms up again, and then circulates back into the Atlantic. Or it goes past Antarctica and circulates um, up into the northern Pacific, warms up, and then back into the, um, back into the um, Indian Ocean and then back into the Atlantic. And so you have a global circulation and topography that is directly affected by where the continents are placed. Um, 
let's do a little experiment here. Um, if we had a, a fish tank, and you could do this at home, but um, I'll just kind of show you what it looks like. It's kind of fun to do. You take a fish tank and put room temperature water in it, and then take really cold water in a flask or a, a pitcher, and then really warm water in a pitcher, and then um, put them in, and, and then put food coloring in them, and then put them into the um, water, and there'll be circulation that you see. They won't mix, they'll keep separate, and the cold water will sink to the bottom eventually, but it will spin around a few times in the fish tank, and the warm water will separate out and be at the top of the fish tank. It's really interesting because it, all it is is water and a difference in temperature. Salinity is the same, pressure is the same, but just the warm water floats on top of the cold water and you can actually see that in a fish tank. Um, let's talk about some terms you'll read about in the news. Uh, El Nino and La Nina, those have a big effect on um, uh, the kind of weather we get every year and, and um, <coughs> El Nino and La Nina. Well, in a normal year, Pacific waters are heated and a trade wind blows that warm water west. And then you get a cold upwelling across the coast of, of South America. Um, so that is uh, in a normal year. But in an, in an El Nino year, and you see a picture of the El Nino year in that uh, left globe, the western trade winds diminish, the warm waters diminish off the, in the Pacific, heavy rains occur in South America, and surface salinity decreases, reducing that upwelling, so you have droughts in the western Pacific. Just think about being a fisherman off the um, coast of Peru and having an El Nino year. It would not be a good year for you because suddenly you don't have that cold upwelling water coming off the coast of South America. In an La Nina year, um, you have cold conditions and droughts in South America and western U.S. and severe weather in the western Pacific. So these, these ocean currents um, affect all kinds of things, and so it's important to pay attention. Uh, tide also are affected, um, impacted the ocean. Um, since we're studying oceans and coastlines, we need to talk about tides. And so this is our a short little lecture on tides. If you're a fisherman or if you like to collect seashells or even take a vacation and go look at the beach, you'll want to know about the tides. Um, if you were on a sailing ship with, um, um, had to worry about catching the tide to sail away from the shoreline, tides would be critical and you'd pay attention to tides um, like you would your left finger. Um, of your left hand. So the moon orbits the earth every 27.3 days and there's a new moon um, where the moon is between the earth and the sun and a full moon when the earth is between the sun and the moon. And so you get these different phases of the moon, new moon, new, uh, new crescent, first quarter, first gibbous, full moon, last gibbous, um, or last quarter in an old crescent. You can also, I like to call those um, a waxing crescent as it gets as it gets bigger or a, wa a waxing gibbous as the light of the moon gets bigger or a waning gibbous as the light of the moon gets smaller or a waning crescent as it's just about to finish up. Well tides are the changes in the sea surface height caused by the gravi tra gravitational traction of the moon and a little bit by the sun. So changes in, this, in the sea surface height caused by gravitational traction of the moon. And you get two types of tides. You get a spring tide, which is the largest tidal bulge and the highest tides, and a neap tide, which is the smallest tidal bulge and the lowest tides. Um, <clears throat> and you can get a um, Sun and the moon both exerting a pull in the same direction occurring during the new moon. And then um, you can get um, the during uh, the 
first or last quarter, you can get um, the sun and the moon exerting a pull in different directions, perpendicular directions, and both of those will affect um, the type of tide you see too, how, how big the tide is. Well, what would happen to spring tides if the moon were further away from the Earth? Well, tides would be lower because the gravi gravitational attraction would be uh, further would be lower if the moon were further away. Well, because the Earth rotates faster than the moon orbits, the location of the tidal bulge changes, and the moon is not always over the same spot on Earth. Um, the moon is essentially stationary while the Earth rotates on its axis. Um, we can kind of pretend it is, since it revolves uh, much slower than the Earth rotates. So you can imagine the tidal bulge is as stationary as the Earth rotates under him. So you think of the bulge with the Earth spinning underneath that bulge. Well, a coastal side would rotate below the two bulges, i.e. a high tide, on opposite sides of the Earth each day. And um, this would also pass between two, two low tides as well. So the Earth has two low tides and two high tides each day. And you'd have to look at a tidal chart then to get an idea of when those are because they change, they change every day just by a little bit. Well, depending on the position of the moon relative to the earth and the latitude of the coast site, the two daily tides may be very similar, similar um, or diurnal or varied or mixed. So diurnal or similar tides or varied would be mixed tides. And so if you look at the lower picture, uh, panel B, notice that an equatorial coastal city would have a semi-diurnal tide pattern, while a mid-latitude, um, the pattern would be mixed. So it's very high on the right side of the image and low on the upper left side of the image. Um, here's a, a tidal chart. Notice you get a semi-diurnal um, tide in the top. You get a mixed tide in the middle. And you get a diurnal tide on the bottom. So which tidal pattern is represented here for San Diego, California? Well, it would be a mixed. Um, because tides of San Diego are mixed um, when the phase of the moon is half full but they have higher amplitudes. Um, some planets have multiple moods. moons. Think about the how the tides would be affected if the Earth had two moons instead of one. It's interesting. So um, this, what would happen is that um, both the moons would increase or decrease the total gravitational force in the ocean depending on how the moons um, align themselves as they went around the earth. So when they're on the opposite sides of the earth they'd be aligned uh, with the sun during spring tides. Um, however, total gravitational attraction on one side close to the sun would be a little less than the other side. And of course that depends on the size of the moons too. If they were exactly the same size they'd be different than if they were different. So um, let's assume they're the same size. Well, consequently, the double moon scenario would produce slightly lower high tides and slightly higher low tides. Um, the two moons were located one quarter, then spring tides would be lower and neap tides would be the same. Anyway, it's interesting speculation. Okay, that's, um, a, that's it on tides. Let's change our subject now to wave action. And let's look at the wave action first in the open ocean and there's a particle and there's a path the particles in red the paths in blue and then um, there's another path along the um, wave that is in green that would be the wave form well in the ocean in the open ocean water simply bobs up and down and the wave form the shape moves while the water particles follow a circular path and remain in place um, so wave size, speed, and direction are, cold, are controlled by winds. And the waves we see in the ocean are the result of wind energy transferred to the water surface. So the, the stronger the wind, the higher the waves. Um, <clears throat> motion decreases downward to a depth about, of about half the wavelength. 
So you see the wavelength from one wave crest to the other. And um, if you see the wave height, that's the amplitude of the wave. So wavelength, wave amplitude, wave trough is the low part of the wave, wave crest is the upper part of the wave. Um, the, more, the deeper the wave base, um, and the wave base is where underwater there's no um, action from the waves. Now, there's still currents, but we're just talking about wave actions here. There's a point under the surface of the water where waves aren't going to affect it. It's, there's no motion there because of the wind affecting the uh, surface of the water. So the deeper the wave base, the more volume of water involved in the wave. And that makes sense because um, you'd have more movement of water above that motion and that um, uh, because the, there'd be more stronger wind, the waves would be higher and that wave base would be much lower than with stronger wind. Okay, so here's a diagram of wave action. Um, if you look at the blue, you're looking at height of waves of uh, about five meters, four meters or less. Green is uh, five to seven meters. Yellow is seven to nine meters. And red is above 10 meters. So the highest, um, the highest waves are in the southern hemisphere. And um, one reason that people like surfing in Southern California is notice that there's yellow there. You do have some large uh, up to eight meter waves in some parts of Southern California in certain, certain conditions. Um, but when you see those movies of people riding giant, giant waves, they're going to the uh, Southern Hemisphere, maybe off Australia or off some of the islands in the Southern Hemisphere to see those waves. So wind generates waves and the increase in size with increased wind speed. And wind speed and distance over which waves blows determines the frictional force and ultimately the wave height. And you get large waves that come from high velocity steady winds blowing across a wide area with no obstructions. Well in the southern hemisphere you get that. You get lots more land in the northern hemisphere so you get lots more wind action in the southern hemisphere. Um, there's no continents in the Southern Ocean to interrupt. Okay, now let's talk about wave action close to shore, and we're going to use this to transition to talking about coastlines. We've been talking about oceans. But close to shore, um, as wave approaches the shoreline, um, the bottom of the wave, the wave base, is now hitting the shoreline, and it changes um, how it affects those waves. Um, water is slowed by friction, and the wavelengths decrease and it becomes steeper and taller. So you have, um, notice the change in shape of the circles now become ellipses and the ellipses, the, um, they bend over. And so waves eventually collapse because those, um, those, uh, uh, the, the, the wavelengths get so steep and water actually um, then moves forward and we call those breakers. Let's um, kind of look at some uh, models of that same thing. We'll see this a couple ways. So which location is the following diagram where the waves begin to break furthest from the beach? Well, it would be at sea because that's the shallowest um, change in depth of water. So um, the wavelength because you have deeper ocean would be closer to the shore in A and much further from the shore in C. Um, <clears throat> let's look at a hurricane because hurricanes would, um, because the wind speeds are so high, would create really big waves. And um, so here's the path of Hurricane Katrina. And um, there's a station out in the Gulf of Mexico, station. Uh, 420440, and it recorded the uh, wind speed and wave height of Hurricane Katrina in 10 minute intervals. And notice how much the wave height changed in, uh, on the right. Left is wind speed, and right is wave height. And notice that there's a correspondence between when the maximum wave height was there 
and when the maximum wind speed was there. Well, when waves come into shorelines, you've not just got a nice straight shoreline, but there's irregularities on the on the shoreline and irregularities on the seafloor, and that affects the um, that affects the way those waves uh, hit the seashore. And when the waves hit the seashore, that bends the waves, and you can get refraction of waves in different directions from the shore. And um, so you just just need to know that you can get a bending of waves, refraction of waves, and then in addition you can get erosion of the shoreline um, uh, depending on uh, where the energy of those waves are greater or lessened along that shore. And here's an example and we'll go ahead and hit play. So um, you get more refraction um, into the uh, heads of where the shoreline sticks out and so you get more erosion along that area and I'm going to go ahead and hit play and so the waves are refracted toward the, the heads that point out into the ocean so you get more erosion on those and sand is collected on the embayments where the wave energy is weaker and so then you get sea stacks and sea arches that are kind of the leftovers from where those heads are sticking out into the ocean. And um, so, you know, just a little erosional remnants that are sticking out there. And you see those along the coast of California. So the wave action tends to even out the shoreline. So as, as um, plate tectonics pushes land up and you get irregularities, the wave action tends to smooth that out. Yeah, shorelines are constantly changing as materials are eroded and transported and deposited. And the, um, the word that's used for that is sediment budget. So as um, shorelines change, um, the sediment, there's a sediment budget where you have erosion, where sediment's moving, being moved away, where you have it being transported from one place to another, and then you have it being deposited um, into another location, sediment budget. Just like moving money. And um, so, waves we've talked about, um, they can cut into coastlines. And here we see a picture of homes in Pacifica, California that were condemned when the uh, coastline eroded 30, 33 feet on into the homes. And so, you talk about an impact to budget, that's rough. Um, here's erosion rates along coastlines, and you see the red rates, red places where you have severe erosion, uh, yellow where you have moderate erosion, and then green where it's relatively stable. And shorelines um, experience uh, deposition as well as erosion. Um, you know, we, the budget does erosion, transportation, and deposition. And that's where shorelines can grow in width with deposition of sediment. And see here we, we see um, on the lower right picture, sand has moved in to that area uh, because of a storm. Um, Head-on currents carry sediment off and on the beach and deposit sand and sandbars offshore during storms. And then what we call longshore currents, picture on the left, transport sediment parallel to the beach in the surf zone. And so you get, um, <clears throat> get head-on currents moving sand off the beach and back onto the beach. And then you get longshore currents transporting sediment parallel to the beach. Um, you get what's called a spit, where a sandbar is partially blocking. Um, you see that little inlet there, and the sandbar sticking out into it. And you get a baymouth bar that where a sandbar is completely blocking the channel. And um, so here you have a spit that's still has some channel left, but it can become a baymouth bar where it goes all the way across and completely brought blocks that, um, that sound area. Um, you can get what's called a rip current, where you have a narrow current of water flowing through a gap in a sandbar. And you look in the middle, just kind of the middle right side of the picture, 
you can see where um, there is a channel kind of cut in the sand and variations in the surf zone with sandbars and channel can cause um, a strong current offshore so the danger there and the reason we're bringing this up in this in this um, talk is because you need to be aware when you're swimming on a beach of where potential rip currents are because you can be swimming along parallel to that beach and suddenly be swept out towards sea if that rip current is running pretty fast um, right there in the lower right side of your picture um, just have to be careful now if, if you get caught in a rip current um, just keep swinging parallel to the beach eventually you get out of the rip current then you can swim back to shore uh, so just just be aware that don't try and fight the current swim parallel to the beach and then you can get back to shore another thing to be aware of is there's lots of energy in the ocean because of these waves and there's um, engineers looking for ways to harness that energy as a clean renewable source of electricity so if you think about where you could generate the most electricity um, the problem is most of that electricity could be generated in the southern hemisphere and most of the users of that electricity would be in the northern hemisphere so um, so just something to think about. Our last subject we want to look at when, on this oceans and coastline lecture is on shoreline protection. Um, shoreline protection. So let's take um, a coast, the coastal residents of Florida as an example. Um, off the coastline of Florida you have tall dunes um, behind the beaches to protect against large storms. So when we go down to uh, vacation in uh, Pensacola Beach area, um, there's, there's dunes on shore and then the housing is behind those dunes. And you want to have wide, stable beaches to absorb wave energy. So if you have a, a storm that comes in, the wave energies are hitting the beach and not hitting the, the home that you, that you own and build or stay in down there. Um, so you have exposed offshore sandbars that absorb the force of those breaking waves. It's all about where the energy, energy hits. Um, humans can erect artificial barriers to do the same kind of things. Um, but um, basically it's a constant changing challenge to do shoreline protection. Here's some examples we'll look at. First of all, remind ourselves of what a sediment budget is. It's the balance between material that's deposited and material that's eroded from the shore. And the first example we'll look at is a seawall, and that's rock that's built right on the shoreline to slow erosion. And so here you have a building that's um, got erosion, and it's, they're going to lose that building into the, into the uh, edge of the cliff. It'll fall on down the cliff. So what they've done is spent a lot of money and put rock there to slow down erosion and we call that a seawall. So different types of structures that can be built are one is called a groin and it's a wall-like structure built perpendicular to the shoreline so it's a barrier to, um, to longshore currents. It causes deposition on the upcurrent side but erosion on the downcurrent side. So in this picture you'd have um, the current going from left to right and you'd have deposition um, on the left side of the groin but then the challenge is you'd have erosion on the down, side, down current side of the groin. Um, you can also have a breakwater and a breakwater slows down the waves and allows the beach to grow behind it. So what somebody's done here is put a breakwater here and because of that, a nice beach is built up, um, so there's a place for people to go out and enjoy the beach. Um, so let's compare and contrast seawalls and breakwaters. Seawalls are closer to the shore, or at the shore, while breakwaters are away from the shore. Uh, both are parallel to the shore and made of similar materials. Seawalls stop erosion by withstanding wave impact and breakwaters disrupt the wave before it hits the shoreline. Seawalls cause greater erosion on the flanks whereas breakwaters cause deposition. Now 
And let's look at these figures here. This is from Cape Hatteras. And the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse was removed. And it was moved um, um, away from the shore. So you have the original place in the top picture and then where it was moved in the lower picture. They basically put it on railroad tracks and moved it, moved it from one place to another. Well, the problem is it was originally protected by a groin that caused deposition on one side, but erosion, erosion on the other. And um, it, it just didn't give enough protection. You can see the groin up there um, in the top picture. And so they basically just moved it down a little bit further inland and away from that, um, that point that it was on. And now it'll be fine for a long time.